oh my God, I'm never spending that on a knife. I'm not going to do it. It's too expensive. But what we do in the interim is we go out and we buy, instead of buying a thousand dollar knife, we buy ten hundred dollar knives and then we buy three three hundred dollar knives and then we buy, you know, two five hundred dollar knives. And eventually we get to this point where we're like, you know what? After years, you know, some people takes longer, but you're like, you know, that doesn't seem too outlandish to carry a thousand dollar knife. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Hello, fellow knife junkies. Welcome to episode number 35 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco from the KnifeJunkie.com. Welcome to the show. Another great one, another interesting conversation with a repeat guest, Bob, somebody that's been on the show before. That's right. Austin, uh, you know him as Epic Snuggle Bunny, is coming back on the show. Yeah. Hmm, interesting. And, and uh, why, perhaps? I mean, I know it's going to be a great conversation, but uh, uh, yeah. any particular reason? You know, recently I've been talking about uh, the custom knife Douglas Esposito from Attention to Detail Mercantile. Mm -hmm. And you finally got it, right? Yeah, yeah. He he uh, finished my knife uh, right after uh, Blade Show. I went to his uh, his shop to pick it up, and it was paradigm shifting. It changed my whole framework of how mm. I look at things, and I was kind of uh -huh. expecting that. And uh, in the lead up to picking it up and after picking it up, I've been watching some of Austin's videos, and he's been... Um, He's been talking about this concept, reduce and refine, in terms of how it relates to his knife collection. He's got an epic knife collection. Epic uh -huh. He has an epic knife collection, and uh, he's looking to refine and reduce. And mm -hmm. uh, that's something I've been looking to do for a long time. I have a hard time doing it. Right. Uh, he's indicated he has a hard time selling knives off. So I figured now would be a good time to get in touch with him and and talk about this uh, this kind of topic, reducing mm -hmm. and refining. Not that I'm going to all custom knives, but I got to say, Jim, holding this custom knife, uh, it changes things a little bit. Yeah, kind of kind of step it up a little bit, huh? Yeah, yeah. Well, you mentioned uh, Douglas Esposito, uh, attention to detail mercantile. Uh, he was on uh, episode 25, yep. uh, theknifejunkie.com slash 25, and uh, Epic Snuggle Bunny, as we said, has been on before. First appearance back on show 18, podcast 18, so that was theknifejunkie.com slash 18. So if you're a new listener to the Knife Junkie podcast and you miss those two shows, uh, you don't have to listen to them before this one, but uh, maybe go back and, uh, and catch those interviews, number 18 and number 25. Hey, Bob, before we get into that interview with the epic Snuggle Bunny, I want to ask you a question. Yeah. Um, something you do every day? Strop my knives. Well, okay. I should have prefaced that question <laughs> better. <laughs> something you do every day that doesn't involve knives. Ah, go to work, I suppose. Well, not every day, but no. no you know what? I drive every day. I, really? Yeah. Well, I that's just, true. That's I true. Get in the car and I go somewhere every day. I have to do that too. And you know, I, I'm glad you answered that with that driving because I found an app the other day that I wanted to share with you and our listeners. I had heard about it before, but I finally, uh, I finally downloaded it. It's a way to save money on gas. It's called Get Upside. Have you ever heard about it? No, I haven't. Okay. It's actually a way that you can get cash back on your gas purchases. Uh, get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone. Uh, whenever you need to fill up the car, the truck, the motorcycle, whatever, you, whatever you're driving, it searches the area that you're in for savings at gas stations. Oh, nice. And what you can do is you actually claim what they call the, the discount, fill up your tank, take a picture of the receipt that prints out with your phone, and that's it. A few hours later, you've got cash back just like that. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I know you're doing a lot more driving these days, and that's probably, is that why you looked into this? Yeah, I, I did that. I, I had heard about it, and finally I just decided to, to do it. And I think I saved 14 cents the first time I used it, 14 cents a gallon. Nice. And when I filled up and then um, snapped the picture, got the you know the receipt, uploaded the receipt. Two to three hours later, I had that cash back in my account. So if you're looking to save money on uh, on gas, it's something you got to do you know every day, drive. You know you got to fill up the car. Here's here's a, a way you can do it. Go to theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. 
and you can get the app and start saving. Again, just go to theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. Save money on gas. Put the money back in your pocket. Right on. You know what that means. More knives. That's right. <laughs> but we're reducing refining. Oh, that's right. Right. <laughs> get better knives. <laughs> yes, that's right. Okay. Fewer and better. All right. Epic Snuggle Bunny is with us on the Knife Junkie podcast. We'll get into that interview next. Do you use terms like handle to blade ratio, walk and talk, hair pop and sharp, or tank like? Then you are a dork and a knife junkie. So, um, Blade Show this year, how many times have you gone to Blade Show? Uh, this was my fourth in a row, I believe. Fourth in a row. So, what's the experience like? I, I haven't been there, uh, as, as I mentioned before we started rolling. Uh, I came somewhat close this year, but uh, I didn't plan ahead far enough in advance and work out its uh, talons into me so I couldn't go. What is the Blade Show experience? You know, it, it depends on, on what – it depends on if it's your first time or not. The first time you go, it's incredibly overwhelming because you're not – you know, like if you don't live somewhere like near Blade HQ or, or you know, GP Knives or Smoky Mountain, one of these big stores, you've never had the experience to go through and handle – everything at once and that's what these shows are it's it's an overload of knives and it's not just in the show but then it's after the show at the pit you're talking about knives i mean you literally geek out for two to three days straight on nothing but knives and so everyone mentions first year it's overwhelming they're just running around like crazy and just trying to see everything and feel everything and then you're having conversations and you're you're passing stuff around and you're going out. Hopefully, you know, you have a group of friends you go to dinner with because that's, um, to me, you know, seeing my friends and going out to dinner and spending time with them at the show and outside the show is also an integral part of the experience. So first year, you're overwhelmed. Second year, you kind of have more of a game plan, what to expect. Mm -hmm. um, and you're a bit more focused typically. And, you know, each each consecutive year that you go, you're more than likely going to be bringing and spending more money than prior years. So you may have very specific tables you're trying to get to and specific makers you're trying to see. Um, so, you know, again, I think the more years that you go, the the more focused you become rather than just trying to take it all in. So I was uh, watching your video recently of, of all of your, uh, you know, pickups, uh, the, the blades, you the knives you bought uh, at Blade Show. And it made me wonder, well, I, I, I knew going into it because you mentioned, uh, you know, specifically that Todd Begg knife, you really were looking for that. You've been looking for it for a little while. So you, you kind of, you kind of hightailed it there, but for the rest of the show, are you going and looking to discover something new or are you going with uh, specific scores in mind that you think you can get a good deal on? Um, you know, to be honest, I'm, I'm kind of disappointed in myself. I should be going and looking for what's the new, you know, what's new, what's interesting, uh, who are makers that people don't know about. That's what I should be doing as a content creator. Mm -hmm. um, and I have failed to do that because I've been doing this for so long that I have very good friends in the industry at, at some of the larger companies, custom makers. And so I find myself just going over to see my friends. And, you know, again, I've, I've known Mark over at Beg Knives for a number of years now. And I had that osteo stuck in my head since the last Blade Show. It's just been on my mind. And so I knew this year I had to hit over there. I had to see if they had one that I wanted because I had in my mind an idea of what I wanted. And oddly enough, this was the exact build that I wanted and it hadn't sold yet. So that was um, an expensive but a wonderful opportunity for me. So, you know, again, I should be going out and, and trying to find more and trying to find new. But um, there's I have so many friends at so many different companies that I, I found myself just kind of wandering around to the same tables mm. um, throughout the show. And I didn't really do the. The deep dig, because the problem is if, if they're a new maker, everything's probably first come, first serve, meaning you go up to the table, you buy it. So if you're not there, like as soon as the show opens, going up and trying to find these new makers, by the end of the day or, or the second day even, they may be out of knives, you know, yeah. which is good for them. It's wonderful for them. But sure. um, so that's that's kind of the trade off. It's you run in, you get the stuff you want or you take the chance that, you know what, I'm going to save my money. I'm going to go try to find something new. So it's. um it's always a trade-off. There's never a perfect scenario with these types of shows. Right. And if you're someone like yourself, a content creator uh, for YouTube and elsewhere, uh, it begs the question, uh, who am I collecting for or, or who am I buying this for? Am I trying to expose the world to it or am I, am I in this for myself? I'm spending my own hard-earned money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that's something that, again, I, I do struggle with. I, I would like to say that, or, you know, 
I would like to be the guy who finds new things and introduces it to people because it's better content. But um, as you know, as you pointed out, and as I've, I illustrated this year, I keep going back to the same people and buying the new models that they produce because I know them, I trust them, I value their friendship. And you know, you recently got your first custom knife, and you got to go to the shop and pick it up, and it's it's a world of difference. I think you should probably talk about that experience and how it differed yeah. from ordering a knife on the internet because it is completely different. And the yeah. way that we feel about it and the way we value it is a whole different experience. Well, that, actually, that's why I got in touch with you, because you've been uh, you've been on a reduce and refine jag this year. Uh, you've mentioned it a couple of times, but you made a, a video dedicated to that recently. And and it resonated with me uh, for a number of reasons, uh, one of which is I, I, I fear slipping into just uh, brash materialism and every new thing that comes out made by a company that I know and trust I have to get because of uh, the steel and the materials and the look and this and that. I, I've slipped into that a little bit. I got to say, I, I find it, uh, you know, watching other people manipulate blades in their hands and listening and stuff. It's a, it's a, it can be hypnotic and pornographic in a way. And it makes you kind of order things that you might not order ordinarily. And um, so I have a fear of going down that alley, but also having gone to, uh, so I got this knife from uh, Douglas Esposito. He's the maker. He was at Monkey Muster. Uh, an event I'd like to ask you some questions about, uh, but he's got, he's a new knife maker and his uh, company attention to detail mercantile. It's, it's just him. He's a uh, Brazilian jujitsu black belt and teacher. He's got a, a great studio. And then in the back, he's got, he's got a knife shop. And to me, that's uh that's my estimation of living the dream in, in a way. The perfect form. Yeah, exactly. And uh, so I've been eyeing him up on YouTube, eyeing up his knives and, and then I had him on the podcast and talked to him. And to me, he makes um so right now he's only making fixed blades and he's got a couple of models off of which he riffs uh, aesthetically uh, and also in terms of size. He makes gentleman assassin knives. That's that's what I that's that's how I see them. And, and I got this uh, this beautiful uh, mid length fighter that he makes uh, in um, in S35VN and PVD coating and double edged with a nice big run of jimping on top and uh, tortoise shell handle scales. And I'm a sucker for tortoise shell, always have been. It just reminds me of kind of a bygone era, but, but uh, you know, the accoutrement of, of a gentleman in a bygone era. Anyway, I picked up this knife and it, it, uh, it kind of changed things for me. And I was kind of expecting that. And, uh, and I was correct. I, I kind of came home with this knife in my hand and it feels great. And it looks great. And I've already tested it. And I kind of wish I didn't because I marred the coating a little bit. But mm -hmm. I opened up my drawer of fixed blades and I have some tops knives and I have some, I have a couple of bark rivers and some nice fixed blades. And they all just kind of like, um, slumped when I looked at them. They just don't compare now. Mm -hmm. So now I, now things are changing for me. I, I'm feeling this paradigm shift and, and this reduce and refine refrain kind of goes through my mind now. Yeah. And you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with, with going out and doing the buy everything, have a huge collection. Cause I, it's, it's part of the process, you know, cause I'm sure this custom knife you picked up was expensive, mm -hmm. um, it, you know, handmade as it, as it should be, but I'm sure a couple of years ago, you'd be like, Oh my God, I'm never spending that on a knife. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to do it. It's too expensive. But what we do in the interim is we go out and we buy, instead of buying a thousand dollar knife, we buy ten hundred dollar knives. And then we buy three $300 knives and then we buy, you know, two $500 knives. And eventually we get to this point where we're like, you know what, after years, you know, some people takes longer, but you're like, you know, that doesn't seem too outlandish to carry a thousand dollar knife. Um, I've, I've been there and I've done everything else and I, I take care of my tools. I know I won't lose it. And I would rather have one piece that, that brings me an incredible amount of joy than 10 pieces. And I only carry them. I don't know what, maybe once or twice a month. Mm -hmm. And if so that, that's the point. Yeah. And so that's kind of where I'm at. I mean, you know, again, it's my collection at this point is probably over a hundred knives. Again, I haven't counted. I haven't wanted to count, but mm -hmm. you know, I, all of them are excellent. Everything I own, I like, and I enjoy, and it's well-made. And I open up my, my knife case and I'm like, I'm like, well, I want to carry that. Oh, but I want to carry that. And I want to carry that. And it's like, well, yeah. I'm only going to carry one knife at a time. You know, it's, I'm not, because I'm only going to use one knife at a time. And that's just me. If you carry more than cool, whatever floats your boat. Right. But I'm at the point now, it's like, I'd rather have something that just tickles me every time I throw it in my pocket and I use it 
rather than I'll have one in my pocket and a couple hours later, I'll be like, you know what? I really did want to carry that other one and I'll go and I'll switch. Yes. And again, we'll, we'll definitely raise our hands for first world problems here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. But life is short. You know, you never know when your, your ticket's going to get punched. And so mm -hmm. if you can, then do. Um, and that's what it is for me. Yeah. Uh, my, my, uh, grandparents who, who definitely, uh, you know, were, were not extravagant people were always kind of, uh, I think that generation always kind of preached, get the best you can possibly afford, you know? Mm -hmm. And, you know, when, when we're talking about disposable income and things we don't need, like, like, um, luxury knives, if, if we can call them that, you know, it, whether or not you need to buy them, that's, that's, that's up to the, that's up to the buyer. But, there have been plenty of times when I've been walking around with a thousand dollars worth of knives on me because I, I, I am one of those guys who carries multiple knives because I have opportunities at work to play with them, for instance, to pull them out and to use them mm -hmm. and uh, well, not use them, but to pull them out <laughs> and play with them. Sure. And uh, and so, you know, there are many times where I've been like, well, ha I have these all and I carry very few of them, you know, on any regular basis. I should. So why not trade those in and and start? start trading up a little bit. I feel uh, that I try and cover bases. Well, ZT put out uh, all of these 20 CV models this year. I should have, you know, an example of each. Why? Why? It's ridiculous. Yeah. Well, you know, again, there's, there's nothing wrong with it because if you didn't go through that phase where you basically worked yourself up, then, you know, let's say you went out and you, you just said, you know what, I'm not going to make those mistakes. I'm just going to buy that thousand dollar knife. Well, what if you haven't gained an appreciation for it isn't a tool yet, or you're too scared to use it, you know, then you're just going to, again, put it in your drawer and eventually you're just going to sell it. So I, I think that's part of the journey. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've seen guys come in this hobby and they have incredible uh, disposable income and they will go through that process an entire year, you know, going from uh, a spider coat to a whatever to whatever. And then before you know it, they're buying $5,000 knives. Well, once they've gone through the entire process in a year, they're pretty much done. They're burned out. And then they move on to other things. To watches or something. Yeah. yeah. To, or to cars, you know, again, right. and that's totally fine. Yeah. But it, that's part of the process. And so I think a lot of people do need to go through that. Again, it took me, I don't know. I mean, I've been doing this for maybe eight or nine years now, but I didn't feel comfortable carrying some of these knives until maybe a year ago, hmm. you know, because again, my, I battle with the value equation that's part of my journey and that's part of what makes it beautiful. So if you want to go out and buy a whole bunch of production knives, cool. You have something to look forward to potentially down the line if you feel comfortable. So totally fine. I also think it's a, it's important to, uh, when thinking about reducing and refining, it, it doesn't necessarily mean selling up. In other words, it doesn't necessarily mean getting something with Mokume and getting mm -hmm. something uh, uh, that's, that's fancier necessarily. I think it has a lot to do with zeroing in on what your actual taste is and, and seeing that um, I can watch your videos and 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 watch you handle a, a Chalinor or something and not need to go get it myself, but to be able to appreciate it in your hands and and understand that I I, I just have always veered towards uh, the tactical in in aesthetic. It just it's just my my thing. I I um, I've recently been into automatic knives and uh, Protex and uh, and I just got a Benchmade AFO and they're you know, it's it's kind of um, touching on the aspect of me that likes guns. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's a different kind of mechanism, and uh, you know, when you're when you're dealing with the top makers in that field, you're getting the best representation. So, to me, getting a $150 um, Protec, for instance, is refining. If I'm getting rid of a $240 ZT that I'm never going to carry, you know, the 0462, a knife I find very attractive, but that I never I never carry. So, you know, even though I'm, I'm selling it off and getting a lesser knife in terms of uh, value, mm -hmm. if it's something I'm going to be carrying more often, I feel like it's more worth it. And that's, that's a wonderful point. You're absolutely right. It doesn't necessarily have to be associated with cost at all. I mean, in fact, most of the ones that I bought from Blade Show were based more on relationships than they were on perhaps a specific model. So that's something that I value is the relationships with the maker and what they produce and their friendships for multiple years. So I think that's a great point. And, and I love that you brought up that if you watch my video, you don't have to own it to appreciate it. And that's something that, that I think a lot of people fail to get online. They think anytime someone shows a custom knife, you know, they're just trying to flex, they're trying mm -hmm. to say, Oh, look at me. I have something 
nice or something expensive or maybe something that's a one off and it 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 kind of discourages me because it's like that's not the point here the point is to appreciate something together i see plenty of custom knives that i think are absolutely stunning yeah. um, one of my friends nearby chris he collects uh, michael raymond's you oh. know and they're absolutely incredible they're inc crazy expensive mm -hmm. and i appreciate them but i just don't feel the need to own them but it's really nice that when he brings them out that i get to take a look at them but i i don't aspire to own those either and so that's something that I hope more people kind of understand is, is that point. You don't have to own it to appreciate it. I love Ferraris. I don't think I'll ever own one, but right. I love seeing them. And if you can't afford one, good for you. Let's, let's keep the company in business. Right. 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 Exactly. Okay. So here's a perfect example. Just looking at your, uh, the blades you got from blade show, uh, the Riot Jack two, mm -hmm. if it were in my wheelhouse, I still don't think I would, get it something yeah. about the two-piece blade wigs me out but i'm fascinated and i'm i can't wait to see uh your video on it tell me about that that thing well that's exactly why i bought it is because it's interesting and you know sometimes i, I do make concessions for this would be an interesting video mm -hmm. more so than this is something that i absolutely have to have so that's an example of that it, you know is a two-piece blade necessary absolutely not is it necessary in combination with an integral frame no we're we're going the complete opposite direction <laughs> right. instead of a one piece blade and a two piece handle we've we've switched it but yeah. people will want to see it you know it's it's unique it's interesting it's not a question of of why but it's a question of how did they do it so again you know long term am i going to keep that one probably not you know am i am i even going to carry it i don't know it's it's a large blade but i'm fascinated by it and i hope that people will enjoy seeing the video and that's why i bought that one so so from a from a practical standpoint just in looking at it do, mm -hmm. does it seem uh, i mean obviously you can you can cut the errant thre uh, thread off of your shirt collar and that kind of thing. But mm -hmm. um, does it, it does it seem to you to be a, a practical knife given the uh, kind of the spaces between, if you will? Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, think about it this way. Like, let's say someone really hard uses their folding knife. Mm -hmm. Does the handle fall apart in use? The answer is no. If it's well made and they have the threads loctited, then no, it's it's not going to fall apart in use. If, if it's a piece of junk, it will. It's the same thing with the blade. We've got two pieces held together by screws. Mm -hmm. um, it's well made by a company of... Uh, by Riyadh, you know yeah. it's going to be a good... Yeah, so it, you know, people want to say, oh, it's just going to fall apart. Well, no, it's it's absolutely not. And I'm never going to push that knife to its limits, nor would anyone who buys it. Right. Um, but could you go out and beat the thing? Yeah, absolutely. It'll hold up. It, and if it doesn't, then, well, no other knife would have held up in that instance anyway, at least folding knife. So again, it's, it's kind of a moot point, um, but people always want to you know, what are the possibilities? And oh, yeah. I'm limited in, in the tactical application of cutting a tree down or, you know, a tree fell in the middle of the road. I'm going to get my jack too. And I'm yeah. going to, I'm going to chop it in half and drive yeah. through the roadblock. Yeah. So Austin, when I, when I'm scaling that wall, you know, to, to get into the bad guys, uh, lair, will it break on me? That's my, that's my question because that's the kind of life I lead. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the Todd Begg you picked up, mm -hmm. uh, absolutely gorgeous. The, um, and now, now that that's like, uh, uh, my dream knife maybe two years ago um yeah that that recurved uh tanto shape is just uh drool drool worthy yeah and and this one just to just to clarify so this one is from beg knives not todd beg so it's not a todd beg custom okay. it's beg, beg knives of california so not to get in too deep in the details but you know todd beg left beg knives and they've always produced these knives which are from the california custom shop so it's made by maybe two guys in their California custom shop, kind of similar to maybe what Olamic used to do a lot more of, or, you know, maybe in the same way that Bill at Koning Knives will do some really mm -hmm. interesting one-off knives. Mm -hmm. It's kind of along those lines. So it is custom, but it's two people instead of one. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's, it's absolutely incredible, beautifully made, beautiful fit and finish. Um, I need more info on it, but the amount of handwork that is in this knife I, I'm pretty comfortable in saying it exceeds any of the other customs that I currently own or have ever owned. Wow. I mean, it's got a, uh, just from looking at it, it's got a real blend of um, kind of menace and... Um, Gentleman. Yeah. Or or even like Fabergé egg. Like, it, like it's, it's part, it's part um, kind of artifact, mm -hmm. like artwork artifact, part like like melee weapon something about it, it it's it really uh it, it straddles a couple of uh genres for me in terms of type of knife 
yeah, it's it's a beautiful, beautiful design. And again, this one stuck with me for a year and I, I knew that I had to have one. So this design is from uh, Jared Van Otterloo. He's a designer out of Canada. Uh-huh. And then it was produced by Beg Knives in their California custom shop. So, Well, for people listening who might not know what we're talking about, uh, just give the model name so they can look it up. The Beg Knives Osteo, A-S-T-I-O. So is that your prize pickup from Blade? You know, I went there knowing that I was going to get the Viper from Clyde Chalinor. Um, I knew it was coming. I knew he'd have a few, and I knew that I had to go to that table first to get my pick of the six that he brought. And then I hoped that there would be um, an Osteo at the Beg Knives table that would kind of fit my uh, design and material preferences. And, you know, luckily there was one that was absolutely perfect. When I went there, Mark was like, yeah, some guy just came over and dropped a couple, you know, like 4K. So I don't know how many knives he got. I don't know which osteos he left with, but um, maybe I, there would have been one that I would have liked better. But this one was perfect. So I was, it was very, very high on my want list. Mm-hmm. Um, but I wasn't sure there'd be one there specifically that would, that would meet it. So it was one of the two knives, one of the three knives that I was hoping to score at the show. So uh, the top piece, it, I don't know, it tied for first and second, I suppose. So Clyde Chalinor, do you have a relationship with him? Um, uh, I, you have a couple of his knives, mm-hmm. and, and I know he's, if not your top, one of your very uh, uh, top custom makers. When you showed up to Blade, did he already have something kind of uh, earmarked for you, or, or or was it a mad dash to the table to get what he had? Yeah, it was it was kind of a dash to the table. Um, I, I got in uh, to the show a little bit early this year. And so I was basically there at his table. He had sent me pictures of what he was bringing. Okay. Um, but almost everything was first come first serve. I just, you know, I knew that one had carbon fiber and one had zirconium. Uh, he had some with Timascus too, but um, I'd like the way that the, um, the Damacor blade uh, interacted mm-hmm. with the carbon fiber the best. And so, um, Yes, I've I've known him. I, I think I've had this is probably the seventh knife that I've had from him, but I currently have three. So I've, I've cycled through a couple of his knives, but he's he's a wonderful person. I think anyone who meets him and gets to handle or appreciate his work, they're more than definitely going to be coming back to him for another one at some point. Man, that's 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 where I would like to head. Your your new custom wasn't that kind of the experience. I mean, yeah, I, yeah. Well, now I want another one from this guy in particular, yep. and then and then. You know, because this one uh, checked a lot of boxes and scratched a lot of itches. But while I was at his shop, I saw I saw a lot of other things, Mm -hmm. you know, in his case. And I was like, oh, geez, that would fit perfectly in my bag. You know, what can I say? (laughs) Yeah. And it's it's one thing to buy a production knife from a a store online and have it shipped to you. It's another thing to buy a custom knife from a, a maker and have it shipped to you. And it's something completely different to go to someone's shop, pick it up directly from the maker, have him hand it to you. I mean. Yeah. To me, the level of enjoyment continues to escalate the more involved that you become. And the next step for you is going to be good to go to a shop and make a knife with him. I mean, yes. that's, that's yeah. where you go from here. Mm-hmm. So that's next, that's next, Austin. I'm working on it. Everyone I talk to, I'm like, so can I come by? <laughs> <Sometimes>. <laughs> yeah. They're like, well, I can't say no because you kind of have me in a corner. Yeah. And in a couple, you know, a couple production, um, or I'm sorry, folding custom knife makers are doing that, like Lee Williams. The Grindhouse, several of my friends have gone and they've absolutely loved it. And they come home with incredible knives. um, That they've made basically. uh And Tom Crine is also working on setting up kind of like a a shop or a thing like that. And um, there's uh, some fixed blade makers here in Arizona, Dawson Knives. Mm -hmm. They also do that too. So, I mean, that's, you know, again, if if you want to increase the enjoyment, I think working kind of up that ladder for me that's that's what it is. As, as you mentioned, it might be, you know, what, I'm going to go down to more autos, more Protex, and that's mm-hmm. how you perhaps reduce, but certainly refine the tools and the experience. Yes, but this but this idea, I've I've you know I've always been in the arts, and I've always been a, a creator of one sort or another, and the idea of going to a shop and uh, even just watching someone make something, but working alongside, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, that would that would just that would blow me away. Yeah, I mean, the the first time I went, I'd be happy just watching them make it. You know that. Yeah, would right. Be, yeah, and then maybe the next time I'd feel the courage to to actually make it or help or, you know, do something small. So so um uh another recent video you you discussed um you managed to sell off a couple of knives or a number of knives actually I think I saw that sales video, and 
with the proceeds, you bought a Rockstead, a seventeen hundred dollar mm-hmm. uh, Japanese production Rockstead. Gorgeous, yeah. sublime. I think is probably a, a, the proper term. Uh, knife. Do you have any regrets in getting rid of those others to get that one? Not at all. You know, for me, it's the the hard part is the selling. You know, it's looking at going through my case and thinking, am I going to part with this? I'm going to let this go. And, you know, I wish I could cut off the emotions a little bit more and just be more cutthroat with it. But once you sell it, once it's actually gone and out of your collection, you don't really miss it. Now, if there is one that you continue to miss and miss and miss and miss, Maybe that's one you should go back and buy. I did that with the Zero Tolerance 0392, the original one with Mm -hmm. the stonewashed titanium and the blue hardware. And I was very, very happy that I bought that one back because that just affirmed that this is one that I can't live without. But once it's out of the house, once it's out of your hand, then I don't think that you'll really regret it unless, you know, again, something catastrophic happens and you're liquidating your entire collection for medical reasons. Then that would be a different scenario. But when right, you're simply right. reducing and you still have a bunch more knives, I, I think you'll be fine, or at least I am, after they leave, after they're out the door and in the box. I, I, I actually concur with that. Uh, selling off, you know, a couple of ZTs. Well, it was when I discovered, geez, I could sell all my ZT hinderers and actually just get a hinderer. And and when I got rid of them, even though I liked them, yeah, I felt I felt nothing once I had an actual hinderer. And the And the funny thing is, is, when I'm away from the collection and I'm thinking, hmm, what should I sell so that I could get more? Um, and, and these knives, you know, certain knives pop into my head. Oh, I'll get rid of the Wii 609 and I'll get rid of it. And I come home and then I, I heft them. I'm like, oh, I can't get rid of this. It's <laughs> smooth. I mean, you know, this has to be in the collection. It's like I'm a curator, like not, not just someone with a, with a box full of knives, but I'm curating a collection for, you know, after the end of the world, when people are like, I understand there were folding knives in the old days. And I'll be like, yeah, we had ones like this and we had ones like this. Like I'm responsible for carrying on. <laughs> so this is, the, this is the kind of burden I put on myself. This is why it's so, so why is it hard for you to part with these knives? Uh, you know, I, I appreciate a lot of things about knives. I appreciate that they're, they're functional and they're tools and it's something that you can carry and use and interact with. The, the more interaction, the more I enjoy something. The less interaction, the less I can enjoy it. So again, I appreciate art, but it's something that sits on the wall. I can't really interact with it per se. And so I don't really have a a strong tie to it, but my watches and my pocket knives, especially Mm -hmm. being able to take it out and use it to open a box or whatever the hell you cut twine, flip it open. I don't, I don't care if you fidget with it, you get to interact with it. And that is to me, that's valuable and that's interesting. And that's what keeps it relevant and fresh. And it keeps the passion going. Uh, the less you interact with it, the less meaningful it is, at least to me. I mean, that's how human relationships work. It's, you know, you, you have friends and they fall away because you're not interacting with them. And mm-hmm. let's say they move back and they're near you again. And all of a sudden that interaction kicks back up and the, the, you value so much about it. And it's not as, uh, uh, something like a fine knife is not as, uh, self-indulgent as a work of art that hangs on the wall and can, can only be appreciated. That's the only, not that I'm dissing art, but <laughs> it's the only thing that it is good for. I mean, that's its definition is there to be appreciated and nothing else. Uh, with a knife, you can appreciate it. You can play it. It, yes, it checks a lot of boxes and, and it does something. Yeah. And an art collector might look at what we do and say, well, that's, you know, what a waste when you could have it on the wall. So I, <laughs> I, I won't, uh, I won't begrudge them for collecting, you know, it's, um, I think we need it. We need something to get us through our nine to five, something that excites us and that we value. I mean, if I didn't have any hobbies, I don't know what the hell I would do. What are are your other hobbies? I know you like watches. Oh yeah. I like watches. They're just so expensive. Um, I can't, I can't really mess with watches too much. Um, I like guns. I've got quite a few guns and sometimes I'll go on spurts and I'll buy a couple more and (laughs) <laughs> and they just kind of sit in the safe and I'm like, well, I'll go out this weekend. And then Saturday morning rolls around and I'm like, I'm not getting out of bed to go shoot. Yeah, yeah it's too loud. So uh, are you on a reduce and refine uh, kick in other areas of your life? Ooh, I don't sell guns. I mean, but anything else are you are you looking to reduce and refine? Um, watches. I, I have some, you know, I've got some watches that are on the larger side that I just can't really wear with a long sleeve, you mm-hmm. know, button up shirt at work. And so I'm like... So again, it's, if I can't 
wear it daily and I can, it's a weekend watch. I'm like, why the hell do I have it? I'd rather have watches I can cycle through, you know, Monday through Friday. So the, not only has the, you know, I've, I've been drifting towards smaller knives that I can carry to work, but I've also been drifting towards smaller watches. Cause again, I need to have that high interaction rate with it for it to stay around and stay valuable. Right. And if it's some big giant, even if it's a beautiful watch, if it's big and giant, you can't even pull your cuff over it. It's yeah. not, gonna, it's not going to get the attention it it deserves for the money you put out for it. Yeah. It just, it just becomes a, a nuisance at that point, which I never thought would, would be the case, but it is. And so, yep. Life changes, situations change, yeah. uh, taste change. And again, that's part of the journey. If everything stayed the same and stagnant, you probably move on to a different hobby. Well, that's, that's kind of a overarching theme, um, not just in my knife collecting, but just in everything. I'm, I think I'm always kind of, um, spiritually on a, on a reduce and refine kick, mm -hmm. uh, though, though I, I, I have to be honest, it rarely comes into actual practice. It's something that I feel good about thinking about, but, uh, you know, I, 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 I keep saying I got to reduce and refine my diet. I got to reduce and refine my lifestyle in general, you know? Oh, yeah. It's a good thing to aspire to, and and something like the knife collection, if that can act as a metaphor, well, maybe that's a maybe that's a useful useful thing. Yeah, I mean, I I would love to reduce the amount of crap in my house. You know, I, I walk into some people's houses, and it's like, wow, you there's no clutter. Everything is so incredibly clean and and sparse. You know, and I find that attractive. But then yeah. you know, you you seem to amass stuff, especially as a collector. You know, you continually amassing, and so. It's probably a good thing that, you know, that's a, an overarching thought or desire kind of at the back of your mind. It keeps you in check a little bit. So, uh, what do you, what do you have planned for the rest of 2019 in terms of your, uh, your knife collection and your, uh, YouTube content? I have a lot of videos that I need to do. Um, I've been really busy at work though. I've probably been at work maybe 70 hours a week right now. So, wow. Yeah. Not fun. Um, but selling stuff can be very, very time consuming. Mm -hmm. You put stuff up for sale, send people have questions, they want additional pictures, send me a video, well, would you take this price? And sometimes, you know, again, if, if it's low enough, I'm just, I don't, I don't really like, I don't like my time wasted. And so I'll just say, no, you know, I don't come back with like, well, I'll do this. Like, I just know if it's that low, I'm just like, no, nah, I'm good. Yeah. I'm not here to wheel and deal. It's just, you, you want it or not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When, when your time is, is sparse, you just can't sit there and play those games. If you have plenty of time and no money, then you can spend all day doing that, you yeah. know? So I, I would, I would like to sell off like half and get down to pieces that I just absolutely cherish and kind of develop what, you know, like a core collection mm -hmm. and, you know, knives that sent the benchmark for various prices, like the Rockstead production knife at 1700. Does that set a benchmark? Absolutely. Do you need one? No, of course not. But do you want to experience one? Well, go for it. If you have the, the funds available or you free up some other stuff, why not? Mm -hmm. So the working on what's my core collection, um, I have a, I'm on, I already did my down payment for the Grant and Gavin Hawk deadlock because that is the pinnacle of OTF knives. Yeah, yeah. So, of, of course, that one will be in the, the core collection. Um, so develop, figure out what my core collection is, figure out what is not. And then see if I can go through and basically solve just about everything that is not part of my core collection. And that way, I'll carry the things that I really love. And then when stuff comes through for videos, I can, you know, arguably spend more time with it. I was going to say, it also seems like if you get if you do get down to something that you that you see as your core collection, it will be easier. It, it, it could be easier for you as a content creator to get new knives, have them come in temporarily to your collection, make your videos and stuff. And then move them along mm -hmm. because you already know, for lack of a better term, what your values are. You know, you know, mm -hmm. you know, this is a great knife, but it just does not fit into the collection now. I've, I've already done the work in uh, reducing it and refining it. And, mm -hmm. and this is a great thing. And I can rec recommend it to people for whom, you know, it fits, but it doesn't fit here. Yeah. I and mean, I think people would be interested to know if, if something is so good that I that I have to let it into my core collection, you know. Yeah. Um. So I, I have a, a pretty big test coming up in July. I don't know if I'm going to pass, but if I do, that's going to free up a lot of a time and emotional energy mm -hmm. to do some other things. So um, I know I'll throw my wife in a couple of videos at some point. Is she also a, an appreciator of or a connoisseur of knives? No, not in the slightest, <laughs> which which I prefer. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah <laughs> so, um, but getting her in on some videos or content or what she thinks about, you know, certain knives or, you know, have her go through the core collection, which one she likes and doesn't like, you know, sometimes she'll pick up a knife and be like, how does this one open? And she'll be like, no, I hate that. Or other times she'll pick it up and she'll be like, I kind of like this one that she'll open. She'll be like, okay, I like this one. I approve and hand it back to me. And I'm like, okay. You will have no idea which one this was in five minutes, but that's okay. Right, right, right. Yeah, I don't necessarily want her in on all of my decisions. But it is it is always interesting to get a uh, an outsider's view on some mm-hmm. on some of these knives, you know. Yeah, and people people seem to like those videos. I did a a video with my yeah. friend who's an engineer, and it was interesting to see the number of arguments about whether or not he was a knife guy. I think we might have chatted about this last time, but we did. He's the guy who carried the uh, he carries the Kershaw automatic launch. Yeah, the launch seven. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, something like that, a little different, um, try to vary the content. Cause I've had, you know, the, the tabletop video looking down, you know, I've, I've done that for a long time. I've done a lot of videos of that. Um, I think people want something different and I would like to do something different, something that, enga- you know, that I'm ex- a little bit more excited about too. So it, again, if, if I get through this stupid test in July, then I'll have a lot more, um, you know, mental and emotional energy to, to focus on different content. You will. You will. Also. You already passed it. You just don't know it yet. <sighs> I, I like what you're saying, but I feel like you're lying. <laughs> <laughs> All righty, sir. Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for coming on uh, the podcast. Uh, again, you, your, your message, not your message, but uh, what's been banging around your mind uh, really resonates with me lately, this reduce and refine. And uh, I think looking at your knife collection as a metaphor for, for other things, not to get too deep with it, but I think uh, it could be useful, reduce and refine in, in other ways too. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And congrats on your, your new custom and kind of your next step in your journey and what, what is potentially a whole wide new world of enjoyment and uh, direction. Well, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm going to be uh, responsible with it and I'm going to make a lot of videos coming up. <laughs> nice. All righty, sir. It's been a pleasure. Take care. Yeah. Thanks for having me. You're listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. Call the Knife Junkie at 724-466-4487 with your questions or comments. All right, we're back on the Knife Junkie Podcast, episode number 35, uh, Epic Snuggle Bunny with us, uh, kind of uh, talking a little bit about uh, Blade Show and this uh, reduce and refine uh, kind of concept, Bob, that... uh, I really think you're you're kind of taking this one seriously. I am taking it seriously, but I also realized that I got in touch with Austin for a little bit of commiseration. You know, mm-hmm. I know that uh, I know that he has a hard time getting rid of him. I have a hard time getting rid of him, and maybe uh, I, I'm I'm just hoping that I wasn't reaching out to him to to hear some excuse as to why I didn't need to get rid of him. So it was good to hear he's been, <laughs> he's been moving on this, and you know, I think I am serious about it. Well, I, I you know, a good point he had. It's kind of like the evolution of collecting anything, and until you go through that the first time, mm. you kind of may be in this quandary, kind of what to do, you know, that kind of thing. But yeah. I had always heard, because I kind of dabbled in antiques and collectibles and stuff like that, mm-hmm. and I'd always heard, buy the best you can with whatever money you have. Yeah. And, you know, there's certain things I collected that, you know, I could only afford, you know, like a grade four or grade five or whatever. But then when I had more money, I would get a grade seven or grade eight. So you're always yeah. kind of stepping up and that reduce and, and refine is a great catchphrase, if you yeah. will, great term to use. But you're always kind of refining the collection but as I think you've said, it's that reducing part that's hard. But if you're, you know, if you're making those strides to get a better collection, at some point your taste will evolve as well. And I think it'll be easier to reduce the collection with those first knives that you started with. Does that make sense? Yeah, no doubt. It's like it's like life itself. You start out as a hormonal teenager going after anything that will possibly <laughs> give you the time of day. And then as you get older, <laughs> you know, uh, you, your your tastes refine or, or whatever. You right. you know what you want. Right. Uh, and things change. And, and I think I'm, I'm, I'm just at the end of my adolescence with this, with this <laughs> knife collection that I've had for freaking ever. I should right. be over my adolescence by now, damn it. Hey, just want to remind folks, uh, uh, another sponsor we have on the Knife Junkie podcast is QuickBooks. Uh, you can take managing your small business finances to the next level. Focus on growing your business, whether you're a knife maker, perhaps. 
QuickBooks Online handles everything. Uh, use this special link that I'm going to give you to save 50% off your subscription, the knifejunkie.com slash QuickBooks. And you can either get QuickBooks Online or QuickBooks Self-Employed. Again, for the first six months of either product, 50% off. Uh, get started with QuickBooks Self-Employed or QuickBooks Online. Small business owners who have a to-do list that never quits, well, they need QuickBooks. So if you're looking to simplify your business finances and your life, check out QuickBooks Self-Employed and QuickBooks Online at a special discounted rate, theknifejunkie.com slash QuickBooks. Visit The Knife Junkie online at theknifejunkie.com. Reducing and refining, Bob. Uh, final thought as we wrap up podcast episode number 35. Uh, you can do it in your whole life, and that's what I'm going to try and do. Get rid of some of this clutter inside and out, internally and externally. All right. Yep. Famous last words. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, I hope those were my last words. <laughs> no, but I, you know what I mean. You know what I mean. Yeah, I, I, we all need to reduce and refine, so let's uh, let's do our best, okay? We'll be accountability partners. Osa. Talk to you later. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Knife Junkie.